So let's, uh, I, I decided uh, by what I, I believe was the prompting of the Lord last week that uh, after Jennifer and I had, had finished the message that there was still more to this uh, word that we had last week. And so uh, I've taken time with that and we're going we're gonna to just talk a little bit more about the goodness, the fruit of goodness um, as we continue in this series this morning. So I've... Uh, I, I want to take us back real quickly uh, to, to, to the verse the, out of there. It's Psalms. We'll uh, look at that in, in the screen in just a minute. But real quick, let me just recap with you uh, a couple of the key statements that we made regarding good, goodness. And if you weren't here last week, it's um, certainly can go back and catch it online. But uh, these were a couple of the definitions to understand when we see the word goodness, especially in the New Testament. This is what it would mean. It was the idea uh, in terms of the goodness of God, making right what is wrong. Now, that's a rather broad word, but I think most of us would understand if there's the goodness of God, it's in any situations, it is a moment in time where God is making what is wrong right. Uh, the other definition we had was that of uh, a perfecting. Uh, only God is perfect, right? That's why we say only God is good. Um, perfecting what is corrupt and fallen. And so this is a part where we start to understand how it is that the goodness of God is working in the lives of every believer because he is perfecting us. That's a good moment for amen. Yeah, like, so you're like, you're so the, maybe the hesitation is you're like, yeah, but sometimes it's difficult when God perfects me. Uh, sometimes it's a little more challenging. Have anybody experienced a little bit of the pain, as it were, in those moments when he's carving off those rough edges. We want to think of the goodness of God in, in, light, of, in light of those definitions. Here's another statement that we made last week. Um, and it's, it's, it's a, if you're, you're, you're new to the faith and you're, you're still getting your head around this, I, I'm, I'm going to challenge you and you're thinking just a little bit um, with this. Um, refers to absolute truth. It's the statement that God is the final standard of good. And that, that's going to be an essential part in order to navigate in the world we live and uh, navigate in our understandings of what God's doing in today. So can we say that one again? Like, would you let your ears hear that one? Would you mind? God is the final. I just, I think it might be good if we had a little more volume. Um, not, um, so really, because I, that is, that's what the world needs to know. But most of our heart and mind has to be aligned. One more time. God is the final standard of good. Yeah. Which, of course, that means that everything else pales in comparison. Everything else. Me as a preacher, um, certainly our, our, our systems of, of government, every, all, all of it, we all pale in comparison to the absolutes of the standard that God is and is established. Here's the other one. And this is fun. Goodness of God follows. Actually runs after is the, is the accurate definition. Is in pursuit of the children of God. Can I just ask how many are children of God? You don't have to raise your hand if you're embarrassed. You can know, if you were to just look a little bit behind you, what you see back there is the goodness of God running after you. Yeah, no, I feel like all the, the negativity of the world is chasing me. That's, that's the thoughts that we dare not allow. What's that chasing me? That's the goodness of God running after you. Sometimes, actually, what we find throughout Scripture, it actually reveals that all the time, God's goodness is chasing after us. I, I went away last Sunday, as I said it to, to Jen, I said, I don't know that we conveyed that enough because I am so stinking excited about it. I like, I want to come out of my skin, and I felt like, I don't know whether we got it. I'm hoping you get it today. I hope you get it tomorrow. Allow your mind to be transformed into an absolute reality that God's goodness is following you. 
And all, all that temptation to buy into the fear or to buy into the hopelessness, look back and say, so I, I use the illustration, so we'll go to that scripture because this is where um, it, it says in summary form from Psalms 23, surely, would you read it with me? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen to that. Amen to that. Um, I, I, last week, I used, a, I used the illustration, um, uh, story, anecdotes of my experience with a trailer. Um, back in my early days of ministry, we traveled across the country, and many times, uh, I mean, it pretty much always, uh, for five years, I was traveling in a vehicle that had a trailer. And so we were, that trailer was packed full of all kinds of gear and uh, doing ministry to kids. We'd set up every three, four days uh, for some kind of youth event or kids event. And, uh, and so we, we, you learn real early to, to drive a trailer. Dad had to teach me. Actually, you didn't really teach me. You, you let me have the keys and sent me down a street not knowing that it was a dead end. And, um, and it didn't even have a little circle at the end. And there were ditches on the side. Do you, do you remember that? And, and I'm, I'm supposed to back it up and figure out how to get out of this. So anyways, you learn very quickly. Um, the, it's not sometimes not the easiest thing to, to, to drive a, with a trailer. But here, here's the idea of that. Um, we want to have in mind that that trailer behind us is the goodness of God. And it, it of course, what's essential to that is, is, is what? in order to have the right connection, is going to be to have a, a hitch um, that hooks up, hooks up the trailer to the vehicle, right? Just say it simply. So now just let me, let me be clear, because I got harassed a little bit, and I mean harassed. I mean, it was a little bit um, uh, disconcerting. I, after service last Sunday, a couple of people came up to me like, Chris, I don't think that really happened. So let me, if you weren't here last week, what, the, what it was is we were, I told the story of about 20 years ago, going down Cactus Road, with the trailer, I was with one of our interns who had hooked up the trailer, and we were just going. He was in the passenger seat, uh, seat and we go over a bump there at Cactus and Tatum, and all of a sudden, I look in my rearview mirror. I don't see the trailer. I look to my right. I see the trailer starting to pass us, and so that's why I got some pushback. I'm like, that didn't happen. Well, here's the deal. It, this trailer was a dual axle, and it just happened to be balanced just enough that it continued to keep rolling, and because of the momentum, it just kept going. And so the way the story unfolds is I'm freaking out, trying to figure out what to do, praying, asking for God's incredible, miraculous intervention. And the only thing that came to mind was to accelerate to try and beat the trailer that is now passing me and has come unhitched from my vehicle. Um, I look ahead, seeing the fact that there was a car in front of us stopped at the light about 300 yards up there, and the trailer is heading straight towards the back of that car. My instinct was to go and accelerate, get in front of at least, but that was, you know, Pastor Jim was still, my father-in-law was still the pastor, and I did have the fear of God in me, thinking, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to pull in front, that trailer's going to ram in the back of the van, and I'm going to be on the line. I have to go and tell him that I've damaged his van. Anyway, so I'm accelerating, but I thought that's the better of the options. I do, and I uh, pause as I get in front of the trailer, and the trailer bumps up against the hitch and re-engages on the hitch. And I look back, it's on, the light turns, the light turns green, and we continue on our journey. Now, now, how many, how many know that it sounded impossible when you heard it, right? Here's what I'm telling us this morning. I'm just reminding you um, that though we look around the world today and it looks like there is no hope, that it is a, it is a lost cause to make right what is wrong in our society. I want you to know God is still very, very much on the throne and the goodness of God is more powerful than any evil in this world. Okay, so we ask the question, the culture of goodness in 2024, is it actually possible? Let me remind you what the definition of, of culture is. It's simply to, to know it's the way of doing life. It's the way of living. 
it's around in our society, and that can happen. You have a culture in your home. How many have a certain way of doing things in your home? How many know that you pray for Jennifer on a regular basis because she knows, you know she has to be in that culture in my home? Um, there are certain expectations, certain ways of doing things. This is how we roll. We have a culture here at SWC. The good chances are, is you're going to get hugged. Like that's one of the cultures. You don't like it? Like that's, we have, a, we have an area for you, but mostly that Roland usually is here. So anyways, but that's part of our SWC culture. We learn people's name. And there's just all kinds of things that are kind of the SWC thing. Um, we're, we're really happy being a, a good, strong, healthy, mid-sized church. Get to know everybody. We have no vision for being a mega machine. We really want to be able to be an effective, flourishing body of Christ. So that's part of our culture, right? We all, how many know we have a culture in Arizona? Um, and then we have a culture in our nation and we have a culture in the world. Um, so the question really associates that. Is it, is it impossible that the culture of goodness... Um, can penetrate the culture around us in society. I want to tell you this morning, and I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm not hyping it up. Deeply, deeply, I believe it's possible even for this small church to be a powerful force in the culture of the world around us. I literally, I'm serious, I honestly believe we can have a huge, huge effect. So it leads us, of course, to the question, how do we grow a, a culture of goodness? And I want to take us uh, this morning, if you do have your Bibles, you'll see it here on the screen, Deuteronomy chapter 30. And this, if you're not familiar with Deuteronomy, you're going to want to get excited about Deuteronomy if you never read it. It's like a retelling. It's Moses retelling and recounting God's commands. It's, I don't know about you, but I sometimes like cliff notes. And so Deuteronomy is kind of the cliff notes of um, all that God had said and all the commands and all the history of, uh, of, of Israel being delivered is in Deuteronomy. But chapter 30 in, in kind of, a, kind of the, the final words of, of Moses to the people of Israel, so this is after their 40 years in the wilderness, he goes with this in verse 11, chapter 30, you're going to... I think this just speaks so clearly to us today. For this commandment that I command you today is not, help me out, too hard for you. Neither is it far off. Sit with that a second, y'all. Uh, what, 1,400 years before Christ? 14, 1,500 years? These words were written, so... Put that with 2,000. Call it 3,500 years ago. There was a group of people that God's word said, like he is to us today, it is not too hard and it is not too far off. That was 3,500 years ago. He says this. It is just kind of plays with us here a little bit in our imagination. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear and do it. And this is powerful. But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. So what? So that you can do it. Like if, if you're, again, kind of new to the faith and you're connecting the dots, I want you to hear the simplicity that God's word is speaking to us even today, all these years later, that you can do it because the word, the truth, is actually in your heart and in your mouth. Of course, that poses a pretty important connection, just simple reasoning. That means it needs to be there. But if it is there, it didn't just flitter away. That's why we know in God's word that his word does not return void. That's what that connects the dot. Um, you, it, it seems to pose the question just a little bit, 
why did Moses feel the need to express some of this to, to those people of Israel? It's like it would seem that they simply needed the reminder and the encouragement, you can do it. God has actually given to you. You don't need to wait for me, Moses, to go up on the top of the mountain and bring it back to you. All of that has already happened. It is now, after all these years, it has been presented to you and you have it. You literally have what it takes in order to follow these commands. That's, it's that simple. He follows that in verse 15. He says, see, I have set before you today life and good and death and evil. Here's a couple of interesting takeaways because this is ancient times. I mean, these are a lot, a lot of years ago. And so depending on your familiarity with ancient Near East history, here's what we can know. God chose to set before them the full reality. And please, this is a, this is a pretty important connect the dots kind of moment. Um, because I, I think there, there, there might be a tendency to... Um, uh, to find discouragement, um, to, like, God, why do we need to be exposed to all this? Actually, God has exposed it on purpose, which is a little bit interesting. Because remember, good, we've already described a little bit of what, what good is, especially the emphasis of moral good. Life here is, is talking about actually mortal life, human life, like before death. Death in ancient times, in, in Hebrew understanding, was much more a, a, a whole uh, unfolding of possibilities in terms of what death would bring. But it did mean an end to human life. But then it contrasted that with evil. And he says, I am presenting to you everything, all of it, the full reality and then Moses does something interesting when he says there in verse 15, he says uh, that, see, I have set before you today life and death, good, death, and evil. Moses calls them, and here's, here's an interesting, personal, I think it's interesting, um, that Moses calls them uh, to a situational awareness and historical awareness. And I'll, I'll connect the latter with you in just a second. If you're familiar at all with security, and um, we've got a Richard and a couple of our other security people around here, um, teach classes, and one of, the, one of the key things is about situational awareness. Um, it's, it's actually of great importance that we're aware of our surroundings at all times. How many know that, right? Like, that's actually interesting on this as things have become unfolding, uh, how many people were trying to draw, they just, in, they're, they're over there trying to look at, at what's happening with, with Trump on the stage, but meanwhile, and I, I tend to be one of those persons, I'm always kind of looking at off the side, and meanwhile, they saw a problem, it was situational awareness. Here, here's what that might look like for us as believers. Um, that we are daily, aware of our surroundings in terms of the spiritual condition of our own life, our family, what's happening in the world, just all these little circles around there. Um, it, is, it, is, it is so essential. It's actually a kingdom, part of the, the kingdom culture, that we have situational awareness, that we know what's happening. Not every detail, but that we have a sense of awareness. And so, God actually, in, in this moment with Israel, saying, I'm bringing it all before you. I'm giving you the full 360. I'm not hiding anything from you. Um, but then he does something, something further that's, that's pretty essential. He offers the historical awareness, and we'll, get, we'll connect the dots here in a second. Again, it's an essential part of establishing a, a, the goodness piece. Because um, look at Jer another, another passage, uh, Jeremiah 6 says it this way. Would you mind reading this? This is interesting prophecy. Stand by, would you mind out loud, please? Stand by the roads and look. Ask for the ancient paths where the good way is. And what? There you go. And find rest for your souls. But they said, homie, don't play that game. Like that's what they say. 
we're actually encouraged, the people of Israel, and um, as we sit here today, have been mandated with a situational awareness, but also to connect ourselves in, with a great intentionality to our past. And what is the past? We just did it with communion. Pastor Christine, beautiful devotion there. The same God who delivered Israel out of Egypt is the same God that will deliver us today. We're actually, and here's what I think is, I, how many of us sense that this, that in our society today, we don't do a good enough job educating the generation on history? Like, have you noticed that? Like, or then there's the rewriting of history, and there's all that, and the shading, and, and again, um, much could be said about that. But here's what it looks like for, for followers of Christ. Um, we have a history, and, the, and God himself is the author of it. And for literally generations and generations and generations, God has been faithful and what was true then when he established moral law is the same truth that exists today. And if you notice that it's actually that moral law worked then and has always worked whenever societies have embraced the, that moral code, even whether they believed in God or not, it has always improved society. And that's what the goodness of God looks like, the moral law. So, so I'm... I'm you, you see where I'm, I'm headed here. He's saying, look at the ancient past. Look back. So young people, adults, like whatever, like look back and see the faithfulness of God and the objective truth, the absolutes that God has offered in every area of life. It's that that is actually the culture, we would know this to be, the formation of the kingdom culture, the culture of the kingdom of God, ultimately is the goodness of God. Like, how many think we need more of the goodness of God in this world, right? And, and you know, I mean, it just, let's say it, uh, judgment begins in the house of the Lord. Yeah, right? So, like, in my own house. Uh, let's go back to, to Deuteronomy. I got to catch this. It's just real quick. We got we to gotta run. Verse 16, if you obey, verse 16, da, 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 here we go. Um, if, you if you obey the, uh, okay, what, why am I seeing that? If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today, and here it is, by loving the Lord your God, check this out, by walking in his ways, by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then, somebody say then, then you shall live and multiply how many are ready to have more kids? Okay, no? All right, kind of went quiet there. All right. Shirley, we're kind of leaning into you younger couples. Okay, all right, so no pressure. It says multiply. So like he's picturing what a flourishing people looks like. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you that you shall surely perish and you shall not live. And so it goes forth in the land. Um, here's, here's what we know. In, in ancient times, Israel was surrounded over on, the, over on the east side. You'd have the Mesopotamian. So all of their religions, all of their worship. You'd have Egypt. You'd have the... Um, up, up uh, more in the, the northern part above uh, what would ultimately be the, the, it, it, both in the land of Canaan and above them. The culture that Israel was surrounded by was so completely evil. You think we have it bad today. No, I'm, I'm not kidding. You read that, so we talk about abortion, like they literally, it was an active part of their weekly worship was to sacrifice at least one infant as part of their, their morning uh, worship. It would be like showing up on a Sunday. Um, 
Their, the sexual perversions were beyond anything we could ever see or understand. Israel, check this out, Israel was completely surrounded by, and it's exactly why the word of the Lord is going through Moses saying, you think it's too hard, but it's not. Yeah, but look around us. Impossible. No. It's in your heart, your mouth. So God intended, so how huge it is for us to have this situational and historical work, um, awareness around us. Because here's what I've, what I've found. You know this. Awareness awakens response. Have you noticed that? Proverbially speaking, you get your head out of the sand, you look around, it actually stirs us to action. It awakens something within us. I think probably out of all of our prayers that we would pray for the church today, one of the great prayers is that the church would simply just wake up. Why would we pray that? Because we actually recognize part of the human response is that when you wake up, I don't know about you in the morning, how many's grouchy in the morning? How many are married to somebody who's grouchy in the morning? How many, okay, wish you weren't. No, you're married to them. So the morning you wake up, there's an awareness, you may, you may until you got your coffee at least, there's an awareness and now, like, we've got things to do. Well, that's where the church needs to be right now, right? Where we recognize in our awareness that there's things we need to do right now, that we actually need to respond and that we can't just ignore what's around us. So here's what it says. Um, uh, verse 19 goes on this way. It says, I call heaven, I love this, uh, I love this. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. And then what is it? Drum roll. Come on, y'all. Therefore what? Choose life. That you and your offspring may be unhealthy and dysfunctional and a church with all kinds of blemish. Total opposite. He's saying that you may live. By the, word, by the way, Hebrew, that was more than just the palpitations of the heart. It was actually uh, the idea of a healthy prosperity. Loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, holding fast. I love that picture, Cleve. For he, I love this statement, y'all. Anybody like this? For he is your life and what? Length of days. Like that's saying like everything. That's kind of the kitchen sink moment that we live and embrace the goodness of God and allow him to be our everything. That is a radical different mindset than me compartmentalizing my spiritual life around a Sunday morning experience. What God's actually invited us to is an entire culture of the kingdom of God. So again, I say awareness awakens response. Amen? Awareness. Wait, so here's what he says. Choose life. Begin now by acting on our awareness. Jesus said these words and so famous and they certainly are relevant to us. John 11, he says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Somebody tell me whether you're alive right now with a big amen. All right, come on. You see, life is that freedom from the destructive works of the unredeemed flesh, isn't it? The bottom line is when we allow God to be our everything, we're choosing to embrace his goodness. We become, if you will, we become the goodness of God. That's a different way of thinking than I need to, today, I need to wake up and do the goodness of God. We start with being the goodness of God in order to activate the response. So here's part of the question that, that came up. Um, I, I really had some fun with last week. 
when it was asked to me, but I didn't explain this, so it's understandable. Um, when the young man, Chad, I mean, I wasn't going to use his name, um, hooked up the hitch and the trailer, and it was a large trailer, you'll see there's multiple size. Can you all see that? Multiple size balls. Well, what happened, he hooked it up, and he used the smaller ball. So when the trailer hit the bump, it released it. And, uh, you know, honestly, an honest mistake. And uh, so he hooked the trailer up to the wrong ball. It's possible that some of the choices that we're making today in our lives individually, all of us, please, that you may have found, or you may not even know it yet, that you're making some choices that are based on your own instincts and you've hooked yourself up to a false goodness. You think it's good. There is a way, right, that seems right to a man, but its end is what? But it seemed right. And so we're, it's fine. Here's what usually happens. You're going down the road of life. And everything seems fine. Until you hit the bump. Bing! Something unravels. Problems arise. In a marriage, family. So because the prominent culture in America right now we're faced with situational ambiguity. Do y'all know what I mean when I'm saying that? Like, uh, we've created an ambiguity, ambiguity, a relativism of what is true or not. Uh, students, I, my goodness, we've got amazing students, and so I, or you know, just a younger generation. I, I, I want to be careful here that I don't point you out, because honestly, we could say this about our generations as well. But uniquely in your generation, you weren't taught critical thinking, in, in, in generally speaking. And so object, in a postmodern culture, relativism became the way. And so as a result, they would just rename sin in order to make it more acceptable. We started talking, we see words like sexual immorality that's pretty clear in Scripture, and we start, we realize we're just going to flip that one around and call it expressing my desires. See, Scripture calls out impurity, and society comes back and says, hey, freedom. Sensuality, the provocative nature of some is now called normal. Idolatry, we don't even use that word anymore. We like personal priorities. Oh, be careful there. Enmity, strife, jealousy. We call jealousy, you gotta go after your goals and success. Fits of anger, we call that Righteous anger, strife, dissensions, divisions, we call taking a stand. And so even if I've got a hateful attitude and tones that condemn and label people, well, that's what they need to hear. They need to hear the truth. In one sense, certainly necessary. But here's the deal. If we're taking our cues from the world's behaviors, we're going to always get it wrong. This delivers to us the perfect cues on tone, but most of all, fundamentally, what truth really is. Have you, have you, I don't know they have it. I didn't bother looking in my car. 
Have you seen the, what used to be on the side mirrors, this thing? It says the objects in the mirror are closer than they may seem. Have you seen that one? Yeah. Folks, heads up, that's what's happening in the world today. So situational awareness, and if you're riding a trailer, you're always looking around the sides and looking around the back, right? Why? Because we need a clear, accurate assessment of what's around us. Um, you know this, that too often the common response of the church has been more about retreat or reacting. And uh, um, that would mean glossing over truth. That would mean kind of creating excuses, saying we don't want to offend, we want to be accepted. These are, these are the little things here. Or we swing the pendulum, which usually is motivated by fear. But historically, the church has always been most effective when we respond with an unwavering commitment to truth, and when she was committed and faithful to being the goodness of God. You look throughout history, it's no surprise that the first hospital was, a church, was inspired by the church. It's, always, it's in our DNA. May we never compromise being who we're called to be. So I, I uh, leave us with this challenge this morning, that how we grow a culture of goodness is ultimately going to require situational and historical. May we never forget that the same God yesterday, today, is also forevermore. He is perfectly relevant today, perfectly powerful to transform today as he been, has been in any other times in history. That's why we would choose a life of goodness. Um, I'll leave you with one other a little antidote and Esther I'll invite you we'll just close in prayer here um, so I, I mentioned that that 30 uh, um, that I before I was pastor here ministry here um, I was traveling for several years and so I was always uh, had, a, had a trailer hooked up onto the van and 30 years ago Literally, uh, a couple weeks ago was that 30 years. 30 years ago, I came into town, into Scottsdale, Arizona, with that van and trailer hooked up to this hitch. And uh, I was coming, we were for the first time, uh, one familiar with the area, headed to the hotel, hadn't even met the church family or the church yet. We were just going to be speakers at, for the crusade. And we're going down Thunderbird um, around... 60th, 64, something like that. And it's possible that I tended back then to drive a little faster than I do now. It's possible. And uh, I'm going, oh, whatever, speed. And I hit a dip on Thunderbird. It was near where I think you guys had rented. And I hit it hard. And we had that big old trailer, and I, it went, we're, we're kind of driving, and hit that dip, and I'm not kidding, that trailer left the ground and popped up, and I got to watch it in situational awareness, right? Saw it in the back. And it never came off. It stayed attached because it was fully tethered, holding firm to what it was attached to. <laughs> Folks, may we never compromise. May we never get weak need with writing what is wrong in the world around us. Knowing that no matter how fast we're traveling, God's goodness is going to stay with us all the time and is going to stay in pursuit of you. So that changes a certain amount of confidence that we get to have. And I was thinking about it this morning when I knew I was going to share that part of it. I was thinking, you know what? 
it worked out pretty good for me. It would be about four hours later that I would meet my wife for the first time. And that trailer was still attached. Let's stand together. Amen. Amen. Invite you to stand. Let me pray with us. Thank you all for worshiping this morning. We'll be available um, uh, there in the foyer. We'd love to connect with you if you're guests and otherwise. Um, but I just, I'm, I want to minister, just to invite the prayer of faith this morning. Are there any hearts here today that have been far from God? Right now is the moment that you want to really, that's the Holy Spirit speaking. It's time to, to really lock on, to hold firm to the faith of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, to His Word, to His truth. So Lord, as Your Holy Spirit is with us this morning and guiding and leading and prompting, Lord, You're, you're awakening Your church in a really positive sense. Lord, we, we say yes amidst what is hard, but not too hard for you. We say yes to the truth that apart from you, there is nothing good. So our heart cries out saying, we need you, Jesus. We need you, Lord. And we say, Come, Holy Spirit, move among us individually, our own individual cultures, transform how we do life, how we speak, how we think, Lord, that it would be part of the active salt and light that we are in this world. For us as a Scottsdale Worship Center family and and even our guests today, we say yes and amen that the church of the living God would be everything she's called to be in this world. That no matter what evil surrounds us, we say Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. And we declare the goodness of God over our nation today in Jesus' name. We declare, God, that righteousness will return. That, God, that we will see an alignment to true morality. Not a political agenda. Lord, not even the political platforms. We are saying yes to the platforms of the kingdom of God. And we say that with great confidence And you all might want to give a big amen to that. (laughs) Hallelujah unto thee, Lord Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Amen. All right. Everybody go make sure your hitch is fully connected. So I bless you in the name of the Lord God. I love you. Thank you for worshiping with you. May the goodness of God reign in your life. And you allow that goodness to be shared with those around you. I bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and His blessed Holy Spirit. Church, to God be all the glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. We love you, folks. God bless you.